Mark, welcome back to season four. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to be here again. Today we are joined by my friend Ian from the Battle Line podcast. What's going on, Ian? Nothing much, man. This is um, this is really cool because for the audience, Jason and I got to meet for the first time in person last week at Shot Show, and it really is just cool to to finally like meet people and shake hands and all that. And for the past two years, everything's been virtual, so it's just. It's great to to have that experience again and and do things in person. So yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me, Mark. You know, speaking of shot show, Mark, have you been there yet? Yeah, I have. It's been a few years. Um, it, it was a couple of years pre COVID uh, was the last time I was there. I love it. I would I would go back every year if I could. Usually, this is where I'm starting to ramp up for um, you know book promotion and stuff like that. So I I haven't been in a while, but I was there with Brad Taylor, who's also a thriller writer. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, doing some stuff. Yeah, I just had Brandon on a couple weeks ago. He's awesome. I've had him on a few times, yeah. too. He's great. Obviously, he's a great author, great, yeah. great human being. And you guys just spent some time together. Yeah. But, you know, with SHOT Show, what kind of wares does – did you pick up anything there, like, for ideas, for court? Um, you know, it's funny. I Like, I, I went around and saw the stuff that I thought was cool and thought, you know, was interesting. So, you know, I was looking to buy a 300 blackout at the time. So I went and looked at – uh, Daniel Defense or whatever, and um, I, I hung out in the Chris uh, around the Chris booth a lot because those vectors are fascinating yeah. to me. I have a buddy that's got one that's suppressed, and it's a lot of fun. I ended up picking up a Scorpion and an Evo Scorpion and a um, a Sig MPX not too long after, and and short made it a short barrel rifle. So I never got a Chris vector, but uh, those were the places that like when I had free time at Shot Show, I would just go. You know, it's like just. It's like staring in the window at Christmas time of, of you know, of, of Macy's or something. Yeah, it's incredible. So speaking of 300 Blackout, did you ever get one? I, n- I never did. I, oh I have so much five, five, I have so much um, uh, 223 ammo. Um, I guess it's just as well that I, that I didn't get them because the ammo prices basically went through the roof around that time too. And uh, I probably have about 8,000 rounds now of, of 223. So uh, I have two ARs and um I probably just need to thin that down a little bit and then get something else. Every time I buy a gun, I bought um, handguns recently as a solid purchase recently. Yeah, I built a, an Aero Precision 300 Blackout a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's, and you could like building one is just, if you ever get the chance, do it. I know really? Brad's, Brad's done it before, but it's so, it's like putting together a puzzle and it's just such a cool thing, man. Yeah. And the Aero Precision one is great. I could put the triggers in it, everything else I want that I want yeah. personally. And yeah. you're going to see a huge difference between that and a two, two, three. So, yeah, yeah, I would say you're present to yourself after the the release of the CR six <laughs> is a three hundred blackout. <laughs> All right, I can do that. Do you suppress yours? Have you? No, I don't. I'm still waiting on my stamp. So yeah. uh, it's yeah. a waiting game. It's been ten months. So once I get that, oh. it's going to be badass. It was seven months for me a couple years ago when I got a suppressor, and I thought that sucked. <laughs> ten months is even worse. Uh, but I've, I personally have to stop. I just built an AR nine millimeter. And now I'm building another carbine version of one. I just, I really, my wife, if, if she ever comes down into my studio again, she's going to be like, where, where do all these <laughs> ARs come from? <laughs> yeah. So we're jumping back in time with court gentry. You know, are we going to get a lot of more feedback? Cause I was, I've been there since the beginning. I've been there since, you know, the gray man, I've been like the beginning. Are we going to go back in time and see like when he first was working uh, with ground branch yeah that's that's the idea of sierra six it's basically two novels in one there's the contemporary story and then uh surrounding court gentry who's my protagonist and then there's also him 12 years ago right as he joined a ground branch paramilitary team and the two stories intersect with each other throughout and honestly it's a 165,000 word book each story is the length of a novel each story is over 80,000 words um, which is a self-inflicted wound I do to myself and write write these big books that take a long time to write. But as I got deeper into the story, it just became more and more interesting to me to like go back and talk about these things and link them up to the present. And I never really, I've, I've talked with my editor over the years about doing an origin story, 
But the problem with that is I always talk about my hero's history in different books. And if you did a whole book in the past, then people sort of know how it ends, you know, via the other like things that I passed passed around in the earlier books. But then I got the idea, what if I go back to one point in time and tell a story that I haven't told before and then link it up with something in the present? So there is still the tension, both of what happens in the time in the past and the present. So it's like two ticking clocks uh, in the story. And um, that's what I ended up doing. You know, and based on a description too, your you know your protagonist Court Gentry is going to go after the antagonist from his past. Yeah, and you got to imagine within twelve years, the maturity level, even with your writing and your character development, is going to be so much different from young Court Gentry to yeah. now, and having to mold that in. So he's he's going to be more of an alpha than he was back then as a team member. That's what I would suggest. Not suggest yes. less, but. Yeah. And, and um, it's, it's that and a little bit more complicated because he's younger and he's actually kind of cocky and he sort of feels like joining ground Branch is a demotion because he's, he's already been with the agency for four or five years. Um, he was like roped in very, very young. And um, so he, he comes into it feeling a little bit like a know-it-all uh, but, but less of an alpha. And he's, he's, uh, the notions of how good he is are, are dispelled pretty quickly, you know, as he joins his team and realizes now he has to play well with others, which is something he hasn't done before. And so when you see him in the present, you know, you'll get, you'll, you'll see a version of him in the past and you'll see a more mature version of him in the present where he is running the show and uh, working at sort of on a freelance operation, which is very much a personal, you know, uh, objective to him. Now your books were optioned way early for Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. And you're creating the storyline. Now we know like Treadstone Project and everything else out there, a lot of things change. We know the 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 backstory of the Jack Ryan stories and all that. Are you when you're writing now, knowing that it's in production, it's produced, how does that affect your writing or does it? It doesn't. I, I read the shooting script uh, of the the Netflix film of the gray man that'll come out later this year and it was fantastic i knew it would be good because i'd read an earlier version that joe russo had written nice. so um i was excited and uh but I, when i read the shooting script you see where they diverge from the storyline and a lot of what they do is you know it's been their hope from the beginning to turn this into a franchise and make more than one uh film although i told myself i will be very happy with one film and then not to get greedy whatever happens after that but um i I think, you know, they built the the film that's going to come out to sort of show things that happen, you know, sort of like introduce characters that come in later in the series. So you'll see some characters like Denny Carmichael and, and Suzanne Brewer, people that were not in the first Gray Man book, but are in the series. So they they very smartly have, have kind of started this world up with it. And um, so it wouldn't make sense for me to try and write for that uh, because I have things the way that I have them in my series. So I'm just going to always be true to my series. And if they make more films, I mean, I've already got 11 books out. If they, if they make another film, I will have 12 or 13 out by then. And they will uh, have a pretty good idea of my ideas about the stories and the characters. When you were talking just the sheer length of this, you know what I was wondering? I'm, I'm looking at like, your really cool setup back there with the fireplace. Yeah. Is it all written from where we're speaking with you? Or do you do you travel around? Do you go to a coffee shop, go to a bar? How, what's the whole process for you? Well, since COVID, much of it has been here. Um, I definitely like to go out of town and I just sit in a hotel room in Chicago or in D.C. or where else have I gone? Atlanta. Um, just literally to get out of town and you know, I, I explain it like and not care what I have to wear <laughs> every day. And I'm, I'm in the hotel lobby at six o'clock in the morning and I'm working from noon and then I'll take a couple hours off, work, work out at the gym um, and then work in the evening. Um, and I'll do that for a few weeks, usually, usually as I get close to deadline where it's like, OK, you're going to have to crank out X number of words a day to, to get this in. Um, I, I like to do a lot of research travel and I like to write while I'm doing research travel. I do the research and the writing, everything sort of at the same time. Um, the last two books, including Sierra six due to COVID, I wasn't able to do much in the way of research travel. So that has slowed things down. I absolutely used to write all my books at coffee shops. Um, I live in Memphis, Tennessee, but now 
I can't do that because if I go to a coffee shop, um, you know, really nice people who I'd love to talk to, <laughs> um, you know, want to talk to me, but you know, I, I'm there to write two, 3000 words and, um, you know, and, and I just get sort of distracted by it because people know who I am locally or whatever. But, uh, you know, that was, that was how I wrote the first four or five books until that kind of became untenable. Yeah. I, I mean, I would just imagine it's almost like how an actor has to get in their character's head. You know, if you saw yeah. like that Netflix documentary, how, how Jim Carrey, when he did, um, yeah. why am I thinking of the man yeah. of the moon? Who, yeah. Man of the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Who's the, who's the guy who's playing again, though? Uh, Andy, Co uh, Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman, yeah. yeah. How, how he went to work every day, like, as Andy Kaufman. He didn't yeah. go to work as Jim Carrey. I would imagine, to some extent, you have to get in that zone to be like, I am this character. How would he act? Yeah, and, and not just with your, your your main character. Anytime you're writing in a point of view, uh, you know, I've, I've told myself from the beginning, it's like, I don't, I don't want readers to root for my villains, <laughs> Of course, but at the same time, I when when you're in the villain's head, I want the logic of what he's doing to, to make sense uh, to him anyway. So sure. um, there is this this point where you sit down and you start to kind of channel who you are in this and and what the tension is and all that sort of thing. And that's you're in, immediately knocked out of it when the phone rings or uh, you know the, the kid needs a ride somewhere or something like that. But you can work, you can get yourself back into it if if you know. Again, having a deadline is a blessing and a curse, and it's a blessing in that it 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 keeps me disciplined. Yeah, you're a. Are you still with Tom Colgan? I am. I will always be with Tom Colgan. I don't. Yeah. I don't know what I would do without him. He's he's my editor, and he's been my editor from the very beginning. Yeah, Tom's. You know, Tom has helped me out in the past with just advice. Oh yeah, reaching out and stuff like that. Just a good guy. I mean, that must be great having. Like almost like a coach in your corner, someone that's been a, a staple in the industry for a long time and kind yeah. of says, hey, you know what, Mark, you might want to look at it this way. Yeah. In fact, just today, we sort of had a, a long conference call about the next Gray Man book, book 12. And I'm like, I've got a whole bunch of stuff. And then I've got these massive holes you could drive a you know a freight train through. And so we, we worked on that. We spent a half an hour just talking about little things. And then since then, he's texted me more ideas. He likes that aspect of the job. I always feel reluctant to reach out, even to Tom, even we're like we're best friends. But still, it's like you want to you want him to feel like you've got it all figured out. But there's early on in the stage, you know, of the of the book, you do not have it all figured out. <laughs> now I can imagine, uh, they, like especially with this massive word count. Now I'm going to delve back into your background and your and your kind of like your influence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I think one of the interviews, interviews we've had in the past, talking about your grandfather, talking about your father and your father was in world war two, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, Ar Army infantry. Yep. That must've been really cool. Like understanding later on in life about his uniform and what everything meant. Yeah. Uh, I, I have it all. I have his uniform that I have, um, you know, his medals. I have some amazing pictures of him. Uh, you know, looking like he's 120 pounds soaking wet when he was uh, 19 years old. He was uh, a sergeant in the uh, army in a division that, you know, I think was founded for World War II and disbanded at the end, at the end of uh, World War II, as, as a lot of them were. But he uh, he and, you know, sort of ran a 60 millimeter mortar squad. So he was right there in the thick of it. And he was sent over. Um, he was actually in California training for the invasion of Japan when the, uh, the bulge happened and he was sort of rushed over into European theater where he never even thought he was going and, uh, and landed in Germany in March. Uh, so shortly before the, the war ended, I think he was 33 days of combat is what his records say. And then he came back to Memphis where we lived for a little bit. Then he got on a boat somewhere. I don't even know where and was in the Philippines when the, when the atomic bombs, landed uh landed they didn't land um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were, de were detonated and uh and and the war ended shortly thereafter but he still had to do a lot of like police operations in the philippines for several months so yeah i think he's sort of credited with being in in both theater i, I know i mentioned brad thor like before we started recording but i just yeah. i gotta say i find that interesting both you and brad thor right ha haven't served if i remember correctly right for mm -hmm. you and yet you both have fathers who served and influenced yeah. you and influenced your career. That's an interesting yeah. similarity. Yeah. And my grandfather was in the first world war and um, I was fortunate enough to have known him. He died in 1984 when I was 16. Um, but I sat there and had 
tens, if not hundreds of hours of conversations about his life with him. Um, and uh, he, you know, he was army infantry in, in the first world war. So. Yeah. Even though you didn't serve, you still have that influence. You still have that, you know, that background with it. Yeah. I, I, I tried to get into air force OCS when I, after I graduated from college, uh, when, when I went into college, I had no interest in the, I mean, I had interest in the military. I read books and stuff, but that was not really where I saw myself going. But by the time I got out of college, um, I think I'd matured a little bit and I wanted to do it. But my excuse is that it was during the early Clinton drawdown stages. So this had been like 94 or something. And I just, I wasn't accepted into OCS. And I, I guess I could have walked into the army and talked to them or the Marines and talked to them. But um, I guess I, I just didn't. And then after 9-11, um, I was 33 years old and I was in a, in a kind of a dead end job. Um, not to if someone from that job uh, watches this podcast they're gonna be like, what, the, what the hell <laughs> no but it, you know, it, just, it, wasn't, it wasn't my calling <laughs> yeah um you always make somebody mad. uh it wasn't my calling and so like i was looking at um you know maybe enlisting or uh you know i spoke three languages i had a college degree and stuff maybe becoming an officer but at that time i had been injured playing soccer and i had some nerve damage in my leg so it, it was it was a definite no as far as uh me going I, forward. I that. never ever discount anybody for not going into service. If you yeah. went in, great, great for you. I got a lot out of it. But the nineties were a lot of people like me. I was the first time I went to service was in the nineties. Yeah. And I was around that time. I was ninety three was I went a couple years out oh, of wow. high school. Yeah. So and it was different. You know, when yeah. I went to re enlist later on, I was gonna re enlist and become a Spanish linguist. And back then, the only thing they offered me was Arabic. And I was like, yeah, I think I'll get out. But yeah, it was it, it, good luck getting into the Air Force. Good luck becoming a navigator or anything yeah. in one of the branches. They were just trying to yeah. just get everybody out. Yeah. I'm surprised exactly. you never ended up in the agency. Me? Um, no. You know, honestly, I just I didn't have a really focused college career the first couple of years. And then I was all dean's list and everything after that. But, um, you know, I went to state college here in, in Memphis and – um, just, I never, I never pursued that at all. I kind of went into international business because I was interested in travel and international affairs and things like that. I got a BA in, in political science and international affairs. And, um, you know, I sort of, sort of always dreamed about like, you know, I, I remember like picking up brochures about even like secretarial work at, at CIA, you know, there's like a track where you can start. Yeah. In, you know, I'm sure they don't call it secretary anymore, but they did in the nineties. <laughs> and, um, and, and you could, perhaps move over into analysis or, or something like that. I remember picking up all that paperwork, but I also remember not pursuing it any further. This special episode brought to you by Big Tech's Ordinance, bigtechsordinance.com. What I love about Big Tech's Ordinance is they have live inventory, meaning if I want a product and I look on their website and it says it's there, it's there. And most likely, if I order it that day, it will ship that day. If you're looking for parts for a Glock, you want to upgrade your Glock, you want to build a Glock, head over there. You want to upgrade a, an AR-15, go there. You want to buy a brand new AR-15 top of the line, go there. Big Tech's ordinance, incredible inventory, anything from, like I said, Glock, the Trigicon, the Surefire. And the inventory is live. If it says out of stock, it's out of stock. But guess what? If it's in stock, it's there and you could order it. Their customer service is beyond reproach. I've called them. I need anything. They're on it. So check out bigtechsordinance.com. Hey, you know what I'm curious about? You know, I brought up Brad Thor again. I hope you don't mind me bringing him. Yeah, I'll let, but what, I'll but whether it's Brad yeah. Thor or when you worked with Tom Clancy, but I, I think of, um, I just think of Brad Thor when I've spoken to him and he's spoken about this before <laughs> as one of those guys in the genre who didn't serve. I know that he relies on Morgan and Marcus Luttrell. He'll give them a call when he's working on something saying, oh, well. would a SEAL really say this? Would the dialogue yeah. really be like this? Is this really yeah. the, how the equipment would be used? Do you rely on any people like that? Like, do you have any guys of your own that you're going to call and say, hey, I need to make sure this is accurate? Yes. Uh, um, well, yes and no. That I do have guys that I call. It's it's weird as, I, as I'm, you know, this is my 21st book that I'm putting out. I write two books a year and I've sort of learned that my forte is not um, 
slavishly getting all the technical stuff right. It, it is uh, building the tension and creating a story that people care about. There's there's a portion here in Sierra Six in the in the last act of the story where I went out of my way to do no research because I was like, this is what I need a satellite to be able to do at this point in time, or or this is sort of like you know the 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 limitations to a satellite. I don't know if the satellite would be limit limited by the way that I've come up with. Um, but I don't care because I need the, the, you know, everybody back at the talk, I need them to not be able to see, uh, you know, what's going on for, you know, whatever, 90 minutes or something like that. So I need that to happen. I could spend a year, um, you know, talking to aerospace people or, or uh, you know, communications people and, and get it right. Or I can just say, this is what happened. And honestly, as I've gotten a little bit older and, and got a lot of these books under my belt, I, I do have the people that I talk to, um, X SF guys, um, is an X agency guy that definitely doesn't help me with the, you know, the ground branch type stuff. But I mean, I, he definitely has helped me with a lot of things and there's other people like that, but I sort of go to them more for flavor and atmospherics. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as I, as I move on with my career, 22 books, 23 books into it, that it's become less important for me. I sort of realized that I was, trying to get details right just so I wouldn't get an email from some, you know, jackass that that was, you know, mad at me about something. And, and that's not a that's not a great way to tell a story. So now I just sort of do the best that I, I can. And, I, you know, I, do, I read a lot of material and just go from there. Now, th thinking of things that influence you, let's backtrack to the 1980s. One of mm -hmm. the best the best decades out there. <laughs> uh, any, uh, movie, at what, any movies influence you and and oh you jump in there too. Oh my gosh! Yeah, no. Uh, I mean, Blade Runner is sort of my favorite, one of my favorite movies of all times, and that came out in the early '80s. Uh, Terminator, um, yeah. certainly like Predator, uh, but uh, you know, Predator has all the cool factor. But and, you know, as a story, you know, I would I would sort of look for something else. But I I thought it was super cool and. I don't know. I, I even like the movies like Last Action Hero and even like sort of the funny takes on the on the genre, you know, when the genre can sort of poke fun at itself. And to this day, you, you mentioned Tom Colgan earlier. He has said to me multiple times when reviewing something that I, you know, the copy that I've sent him, he will if if a joke. He comes back to me and says, this joke sounds like it was something Arnold would have said in 1986 or something. <laughs> it's like I know exactly what he means. And I'm like, OK, too far. I get it. I can. I can dial it back in a little bit, but yeah, I, I was hugely influenced by that lethal weapon. Um, there's no better, there's no better film than Die Hard, like scene for scene for scene, as far as action and fun and um, you know just cool dialogue and everything like that. So, and then you know, get out of the '80s and movies like Man on Fire and oh, obviously, yeah. obviously um, Saving Private Ryan, stuff like that are 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 my favorites. Well, you know, the original Man on Fire came out in, I think, 80-something, too. It's Scott yeah, Glenn. Yeah, Scott Glenn, right. Uh, yeah, and Joe Pesci that. was in that. Was he? He was a, the wow. little guitar dude that was having, like, a little PTSD flashback, one of his I friends. I have to watch that again. That is yeah. great. I didn't know that. Ian, did you see uh, man, the original Man on Fire? No, to be you know it's funny. I I'm a guy who could like talk music, and I really know my stuff. With movies, I don't, and and I am gonna keep it real here. I didn't know it was a remake. I I saw the Denzel Washington, and I yeah. thought that was the film. <laughs> yeah, Scott Glenn, 1987. <laughs> yeah, there's Joe Pesci. Brooke Adams was in it. Jonathan Price. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. That's, That's one of those things with with our podcast with Battle Line. It's like Chris could really talk movies. He knows that stuff. Mm -hmm. I could talk music, and and like I have no idea what I'm talking about with movies. And and he's yeah. the same with music. Like we mentioned Pantera, and he's like, "Wait, those guys aren't still alive." I'm like, <laughs> "That has, hasn't been for a while, man." <laughs> okay, Mark. I was going to throw this out there for Court Gentry, but I'm going to throw it out for Mark because I know Mark knows his weapons, zombies. You're in the middle mm -hmm. of a field. You got hundred yard radius around you. Mm -hmm. Zombies are attracted by um, sound, and you have yeah. choices of three guns: a uh, Ruger 1022 with a thousand rounds. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about how many? Did I say any zombies? Are about 80, yeah. 90 zombies? 80, 90 zombies, a hundred in a hundred yard radius. Radius. You get a okay. Ruger 1022. Okay. Uh, M4, but you only have a you have a bay a bayonet on it. I actually okay. can't have a band. You just have a knife and you have a, 
a stifled M4, or you have a shotgun with unlimited ammo. With unlimited ammo. Unlimited ammo. Hmm. And it's a pump shotgun too. Slugs or or, bird, or bird double shot. up? No, double okay. up. We'll go with double, double up. up. Okay. And same um, parameters, headshots. Okay. Headshots. Can it be one of those? Like I have a Remington 870. That's it. Um, Remington 870 with five shots. With five shots. I don't get one of the like four, five foot long. Nope. Because that, <laughs> <laughs> that would affect my decision. I know. Part of me says the, the shotgun still, but you say they're they're attracted to sound. Yep. Um, a suppressed M4 is not quiet. Oh. <laughs> um, the 1022 would surely be quiet, but if, am I accurate enough to uh, put those through eyeballs um, at a hundred? I mean, I, I guess as they get closer. Um, okay, I'll give you. I'll give you a. I'll give you a little a bogey on there. Okay. So we're talking zombies, and that's one thing about movies. They never. You don't have to shoot them through the eye because you got to figure that they've been dead for a little while. So a, a 22 bullet's going to penetrate the skull cap. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think I'm going. I mean, what what what's my magazine situation with the 1022? Uh, 20 rounds. And I've got more than one magazine, or do I just have the the CCI? Uh, uh, yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> Rimfire ammo is still in the cases. Yeah, then I'm screwed. I'm dead. Yeah. I'm a dead man. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you six clips. All right. Six mags. I, How's that? Six yeah. mags. I I I guess I'd do the 1022. It's such a reliable gun. I used to have one. Yeah. I don't have one anymore. It's such a reliable gun. And uh, you said a thousand rounds, ninety yeah. of them. Yeah, I mean, I guess the shotgun would be the like. I, for, my first thought would be zombie sh equals shotgun, but you you sort of changed the playing field mm -hmm. there a little bit as far as the the zombies um, thing. So I'm going to say the ten twenty two. There we go. You know, Ian, what do you got before I before I give my response? I'll be the first. To say, I don't I don't know guns well enough oh, to give you an accurate answer that. on this. <laughs> However. You know what this question is reminding me of? I, 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 and I'll throw him a plug here. Have you ever listened to Clint Emerson's uh, podcast? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Can you survive this podcast? Yeah, yeah, it's it's cool. He does this same type of thing because he'll bring you through a scenario, and it's just yeah, it's like a choose your own adventure book. And yeah, as far as I know, like it's the first podcast like that. I I said it to Chris when we did our podcast. I was like, you know, I like what we do, but I I said truthfully, I don't think this podcast is changing the game. Like. There's many podcasts like this where you interview people. I think Quint Emerson's podcast, there's really nothing else like that. And that's what it reminded me of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, li I like his books as well. I, he's I, he's I, a great I, guy. Great guy. Is he? Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I, I haven't met him. I was in the same room, with him, but I never got a chance to meet him. Um, I, I will say that uh, going back to the zombie question, if I was standing there on a pile of 90 dead zombies, with a Ruger 1022, I feel like I'd lose some some of the cool factor with having that's true. Having, having the hot Ruger, I'd probably rather have the smoke, <laughs> the smoke 870, but um, I still think I'm gonna stick. Yeah, I started throwing the zombie question out there a while ago before Clinton. no one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say that you copied him or anything. No, no I, it, he was he was supposed to be a shot show too, but he, he apparently got COVID because I saw uh, at his booth with uh he was scheduled there with Andy Stumpf. It was like the whole uh, yeah. line of that Gators booth. Um and I got to meet Andy Stumpf, which by the way, you probably heard in that podcast for some reason didn't like me referring to him as a Navy SEAL. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was like, he was like, for, I thought, I, I thought I, I fucked up the question, quite honestly, because he was like, well, first of all, I'm not a Navy SEAL, and and I'm like, wait, am I getting my information? He's like, I'm retired. He's like, all right, all right. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I figured I'd see Clint Emerson there, but great guy, just all around. So yeah, just throwing that out there. But no, you were not copying Clint Emerson. Not trying <laughs> no, I'm to insinuate that. No, I talked to Clint when he was taking over that podcast. That's an excellent concept. Excellent. It is. It is. It's very cool. Very innovative. And. Nothing else really like that. I dig it. Now, Mark, what's something that you want to talk about? We got last question here. Mark, ask <laughs> yeah. yourself a question. Because well, I, you know what? I do the research <laughs> on these shows, and and you and I have talked. I don't know how many times you've been on the show. Um, but I'm always I, I I hate bombarding you with questions about your process and everything. But what's something that you always wanted the audience to know, but you never really said that you're always oh. waiting to tell them. Oh, that put me on the spot. Um, yeah, I mean, well, besides you know, getting a 300 blackout when you're done with this. <laughs> with this well, you know what? Um, last fall, it's like the, one of the, the one of the cool, you, you don't want to say the coolest aspect of this job is 
is the research that you get to do, but it's definitely one of the coolest and um, the coolest piece of research that I've ever done. I did last September. Um, I got to fly back seat in an F-18, uh, Navy, Navy Reserve uh, F-18 uh, down in New Orleans. And um, it was it was the coolest thing I've ever done by, by a factor of I don't even know what. It was it was fantastic and uh, did six and a half G's or something. And, uh, it was, it was crazy. And so, you know, that, that's like one part of this job. You, some, some authors really glamorize being a writer. And to me, it's like, you know, I'm sitting on a couch with a cup of coffee, uh, and, and the laptop on my knees for six, seven hours a day by myself. And I'm not, you know, going out there and, you know, slaying dragons or whatever, but you do a few times a year, get to do some really cool stuff. And, uh, that was the coolest thing I did. And even though I couldn't do location research for CR6, um, the, the book I have, uh, the book I'm starting to work on now, I'm going to go to St. Lucia and I'm going to go to a couple other locations. And then I have another book to write this year, which will be the second book in my Red Metal series that I co-authored with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rip Rawlings. And we're hoping to go over to Taiwan and Japan and do some research over there. So that's a cool aspect of the job that, uh, you know, like I like I like talking about it because it, it is so different from what you're doing 99 percent of the time, which is <laughs> sitting there by yourself trying to make up crap. I have a I have a question I was wondering, um, you know, from people that I've spoken to and people I've interviewed, I, I, I did a show for a long time with Jack Murphy and he was working yeah. on Jim West's book, who, by the way another great guy who, who would be great for the podcast uh special forces legend martial artist but jack's written fiction jack wrote a memoir and when he was working with jim west he said to me and i've heard other people said he said the hardest thing to do was to write from someone else's perspective he's like mm -hmm. to write in jim's voice was an extremely hard thing and i i don't think i'm saying anything he wouldn't say but he, he told me i don't think i'll ever do it again so mm -hmm. i'm just wondering when you had to take over for tom clancy how hard was it to say I get, I want to get in his head and not use my style and make sure the the readers are getting exactly what they would expect from a Tom Clancy book. And, and that they're not going to pick this up when you started early on, I know you worked with him, but I'm right. saying when you took over so that the audience wasn't going to say, this isn't the same without him, you know? Right. Right. Well, I, if I took over for him from the beginning, if I didn't write the three books with Tom before he passed away, I would not have had the cojones to jump in and be like, you know, the guy picking up the Jack Ryan mantle. We had done the three books together. And then when they asked me to continue this, then I felt like I was the right guy for the job because I've been a huge Clancy fan from the eighties until 2011 when I started working with him. And, you know, we, we had done the three books and I felt like I wasn't, channeling him i wasn't trying to sound like him but i did believe that i knew the characters really well and i knew what uh you know jack ryan would say or what uh john clark would say or chavez would say in this situation so basically i saw it as my job to come up with contemporary si situations or, or you know problems for the for these heroes that everybody knows and loves and then have them you know deal with them faithfully based on what they would have done back when Tom was writing them. So it definitely wasn't trying to sound like Tom Clancy's voice. Um, I, I think that would have been a disrespectful B I'd have probably been tarred and feathered and run out of town and C I just wouldn't have been able to pull it off very well. So it, it was, it was my voice, but with a really good understanding of these like legacy characters that I didn't create, but had spent, I'd spent a lot longer with Tom Clancy's characters than I had with my own characters. Cause I only, I only had two books out when I started writing with Tom. J Jason may have asked you this. So I I'm just curious and it connects with that question. So I, I just want to know, and uh, I don't know if you've covered it, but how did that connection first happen? How did you start working with Tom Clancy? Yeah. I, Tom Colgan, my editor was also Tom Clancy's editor. And, and I knew that from, uh, you know, it wasn't when, when I wrote The Gray Man and I finally got an agent to represent me, that agent sent me sent The Gray Man to 10 publishers and nine of them said no. And, and Tom Colgan said yes. And and I was like, well, it's pretty cool. The guy that said yes is Tom Clancy's editor. I thought that was really cool. But yeah. it, I remember those early days. I was almost sort of afraid to, 
to invoke Clancy's name when talking to my editor, you know, it's just kind of like that's rarefied air. And, you know, I'm just happy to be here and have my little spot in the corner of, of your, of your publishing house. But then I got this call in 2011 um, from my agent. He's like, are you sitting down? I was like, yeah. And he said, um, Tom Colgan is asking if you'd be interested in writing with Tom Clancy. And it was really intimidating, you know, because it, at that point I'd had two paperback books out and I turned in the third, but it hadn't come out yet. I was not a big name. Um, yes, Gray Man had sold to Hollywood, but a lot of things sell to Hollywood and nothing ever happens. I mean, the vast, vast majority of things that sell to, to Hollywood go no further. So I wasn't a big shot by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I, I was like, you, you've got to take this opportunity and run with it. And so, you know, I worked my ass off and, um, and, and got and landed the job, but it was basically the, the, he was looking for a co-author and we had the same editor and my editor thought of me, which to this day, I don't, yeah, I think my editor thought of me because I, my editor used to compliment me on when he called me, I always answered the phone and, <laughs> and, and some, I guess some authors are, are hard to get on the phone or whatever. And I'm like, that might be the whole reason for my success is that like I very diligently answered the phone when he called. So he's like, Hey, I need a guy to work with Tom Clancy. This dude um, shows up to work. So let's, let's give him a shot. That's some good awesome. career advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Answer the phone. <laughs> well, the book Sierra six comes out February 15th and this is, going to be a great one i love going back in time and mark i appreciate coming on the show oh, and again, i appreciate the co-host oh absolutely yeah. this this was an honor and i've never spoken with mark spoken with mark and, and i've gotten the chance to interview so many you know major authors so this was definitely an honor and and we'll have you on battle line at some point i know it love won't it. be uh in the near future because we have a lot lined up but we'll make it happen because this was great that'd be terrific yeah this is always fun jason and and, and again thanks for the mug and that's so cool the hat i'm a hat guy but i'm i'm an either or hat guy this is can you see no? oh yeah i see yeah, it, huh? yeah, 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 yeah. um i usually don't wear hats uh unless my hair you know is askew and then and at that point i'll wear the hat all day I can, i'll come into this hat all day or, or or not wear it at all